scholars have marched towards the stage speakers are awaiting to present critics are ready with their responses and you all are so enthusiastic to partake but before all these events we must hoist the green flag to our session with a prayer prayer should be the key and lock of any event surrendering ourselves to the lord let us join gita rollers to praise the lord through this prayer song as the prayer song is sung may I request the distinguished guests mrs estel mr Ro and reverend father dr anthony lawrence reverend dr richard brito reverend dr anthony das to light the lamp Thank you dear brothers for fashioning our minds and hearts to God. Please be seated. Sunshine is a welcome thing because it brings a lot of brightness. May I request Reverend Dr. Anthony Dias, the Dean of Theology, the sunshine amidst us to bright the brightness to this seminar by welcoming the gathering. Good morning to you all. The post synodal apostolic exhortation Amoris Laetitia The Joy of Love of the Holy Father Francis dated 19th March 2016 speaks about love family marriage spouses children challenges in the family and the spiritual well-being of the family. In Article 11, the Holy Father says, Our God in His deepest mystery is not solitude, but a family. For He has within Himself fatherhood, sonship, and the essence of the family, which is love. Adding to that, 
St. Paul relates the couple to the mystery of the union of Christ and the Church. Pope John Paul II in his apostolic exhortation, Familiaris Consortio, says, The family in the modern world has been beset by the many profound and rapid changes that have affected society and culture. Many families are living this situation in fidelity to those values that constitute the foundation of the institution of the family. Others have become uncertain and bewildered over their role or even doubtful and almost unaware of the ultimate meaning and truth of conjugal and family life. It is urgent that we address this issue. Today, the Faculty of Theology has organized this seminar on the topic Marriage and Family. Marriage and Family Today Challenges and Solutions. I take this opportunity to welcome our beloved President, Reverend Dr. A. Lawrence, who will also deliver the inaugural address. A warm welcome to you, dear Father. We have with us our beloved rector, Reverend Dr. Richard Brito, who is the brain behind this seminar. He and his department have put together their heart and soul to organize this seminar. I extend a warm welcome to you, dear Father, and all the members of the Department of Moral Theology. We have very special guests today to address, enlighten, and to share with us their own experience of their family and marri married life. I take this opportunity to welcome Mrs. Estelle and later on also uh, Mr. Roshan and Mrs. Sandhya Menendez will be coming to share their experience with us. I welcome them all. I take pride in welcoming our beloved speakers, Brother Thomas Berna, who will present a paper on the topic, Challenges of Family Today, Individualism as a Threat to, mar to Marriage and Family Life. Sister Mary Nayak, who will respond to the above paper. Sister Arukya Priya, who will present the paper on the topic, Sacrificial Love, commitment and fidelity as the secret of successful marriage and family life and brother Ajito Xavier who will respond to the above paper. A very cordial welcome to you dear brothers and sisters. The presence of the faculty members is joy, strength and encouragement to our students. I extend a warm welcome to all the professors present here. Welcome to you, dear fathers. And my dear students, you are our strength, happiness, and our pride. This seminar would be meaningless without your presence. A cordial welcome to you, my dear students. Hoping that you would benefit from the seminar, I wish you all the very best. Thank you, dear father, for your smile and words of welcome. Family is not an important thing, it is everything, says Michael J. Fox. Pope Francis says, protect your families, be sanctuaries of respect for life. These sayings directly stresses on the very fact of relevance. The topic of today's theological seminar is so applicable to any one of us because all of us are members of a family. Fulfilling the vision of Pope Francis, this theological seminar connects the dots with chock full of ideas. 
May I now request Rev. Dr. Anthony Lawrence, the President of St. Peter's Pontifical Institute, to deliver the inaugural address. Esteemed Chief Guests, Mrs. Sestel, Reverend Dr. Anthony Dias, the Dean of Theology, Very Reverend Father Richard Brito, the Rector of St. Peter's Pontifical Seminary and the Moderator of the Seminar, Brothers Thomas Perna, Ajito Xavier, Sisters Araki Priya and Mary Nayak, Reverend Dr. Lourdes Army, the controller of examinations, my dear sisters and friends. With a deep sense of gratitude to the Faculty of Theology, I stand here before you feeling privileged to deliver the inaugural address for the Theology Seminar on Marriage and Family Today, Challenges and Solutions. Mother Teresa said once, What can you do to promote world peace? Go home and love your family. The Second Vatican Council document Gaudi Math Space No. 52 says, Family is the primary and fundamental school of humanity. Pope Francis says in his Encyclical Gaudium, Evangeli Gaudium, Family is the fundamental cell in society where we learn to live with others despite our differences and to belong to one another it is also the place where parents pass on their faith to their children. Number 66. Bible says, Marriage is a divine institution. Marriage should be honored by all. Hebrews 13.4 Yet, with all this, when we make a critical analysis of the present status of marriage and family life, it is distressing to note that the very basis of both the institutions are called into question. Today, families and marriages find themselves in profound crisis due to erosion of fundamental values such as permanence of marriage, unity and sanctity of family life, etc. Today, family has taken a center stage. In the recent decades, the world has witnessed a massive degradation of the family values as never before. There are two kinds of trends coexisting today. On the one hand, there is more insistence on personal freedom, equality, promotion of the dignity of women, responsible procreation and education of children, etc. On the other hand, family values are being questioned by radicals under the guise of real freedom and release from the outdated traditional society. Most families suffer from erosion of traditional values. They are attacked from every side. Attempts are made to destroy the very fabric of the families and so on. The following citation from Pope Francis in his recent audience with some offers us a bird's eye view of the challenges facing families today. Family is hit, that the family is knocked and that the family is debased as a way of association. Can everything be called a family? How many families are divided? How many marriages are broken? How much relativism there is in the concept of the sacrament of marriage? At present, from a sociological point of view and from the point of view of human values as well as in fact of the Catholic sacrament, of the Christian sacrament, there is a crisis of the family, a crisis 
which it is hit from all sides and left very wounded loss of cultural continuity the values of respect for life filial piety towards parents elders and ancestors sense of community etc the values that were nourished and cherished by the indian society for many centuries exaggerated individualism spiritual desertification that means deterioration of moral and religious values such as sacredness stability etc and making religion a private affair thus reducing the witness and mission of the christian family increased rate of divorce cohabitation having been legalized in india are all challenges faced by families today a culture that marriage bond need not be permanent is also strongly evolving the culture of temporary that nothing is permanent has made many people give up commitment on marriage and family in the recent past the supreme court of india had thrown its weight behind living relationships it had observed sadly that if a man and a woman in love decide to live together as a couple without entering into marriage contract it is well within their right to life and this can by no means considered a criminal offense nevertheless everything is not negative we are not to be driven into despair in the first place what we do need absolutely is an awareness of the situations or the colonizations we find ourselves in and courage and strength to say an emphatic no to them causing great damage to these institutions as pope francis would exhort us i quote pope francis beware of the new ideological colonization that tries to destroy the family it is not born of the dream that we have come from god and prayer it comes from outside and that is why i call it a colonization let us not lose the freedom to take forward the mission god has given us the mission of the family and just as our peoples were able to say in the past no to the period of colonization as families we ought to be very wise and strong to say no to any attempted ideological colonization that could destroy the family it is absolutely essential for us to emphasize marriage as the sacrament of covenant love between husband and wife and the mirror of god's own covenant love for his people human family is the image of a trinitarian family it is the image of god who in his deepest mystery is not all by himself but a family since he has in himself fatherhood sonship and the essence of the family which is love says pope st john paul ii the second vatican council following is in john chrysostom called family a domestic church a church in miniature pope saint john paul ii in his encyclical familiaris consortium number 36 states parents are appointed by god himself as the first and principal educators of their children and their right is completely inalienable parents teaching role is so decisive that scarcely anything can compensate for that failure the family as a domestic church needs also to become a sign and sacrament of reign of god it should become a community in which justice equality and tranquility prevails the same pope goes on to affirm the family has the mission to god reveal communicate love and so on this is a living reflection of and a real sharing in god's love for humanity and the love of christ the lord for the church is bride number 17 familiaris consortium he also makes the point clearer in his letter to families the universal church and every particular church in her is most immediately revealed as the bride of christ in the domestic church and in its experience of love conjugal love parental and maternal love 
fraternal love the love of a community of persons and of generations could we even imagine human love without a bright guru and the love with which he first loved to the end the conversion of one member in a family could and should serve as a vehicle for the conversion of the other members in the same family the conversion of zakayus brought about the conversion of the whole family and brought salvation to the entire family and so jesus says today salvation has come to this house conversion of cornelius had an impact on the whole family the saving experience of the jailer in acts indeed exerted influence on the entire family paul affirms the unbelieving husband is made holy through his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy through her husband 1 corinthians 7:14 the above instances from the bible provide us with deep insights about the evangelizing role of every member of the family towards others in their own families the couples through their loving communion can bear witness to their children the world outside a broken communion or a broken family is far from realizing this the holy bible bears witness to this truth jesus tells the samaritan women go call your husband and come back also fidelity to the marital covenant in itself can be loudest proclamation particularly in our time when the family values are threatened by numerous aberrations thus every christian family should truly become a sign of grace to other families by preserving the grace in their family through their mutual love and affection in their everyday concrete and existential life situations there is still great hope for the revival of the institutions of marriage and family as the family is at the heart of god's purpose and is indeed god's design for human kind it needs to be emphasized in unequivocal terms that the properties and ends of marriage are part of god's will for humanity reproduction is family's fundamental function and participation in god's creative mission when the families remain faithful to these divine plans and thus leading a witnessing life they can become powerful and dynamic agents of churches evangelizing mission my dear friends i cannot but sincerely appreciate the deep sense of commitment and duty consciousness of Reverend Dr Anthony Dias the dean of theology he is known for being very systematic and duty mindedness as everyone here knows i thank him very sincerely for his meticulous arrangements for the annual seminar of the faculty of theology thank you dear father <laughs> secondly my appreciation goes to Reverend Dr Richard Brito our beloved rector the moderator of the seminar he would always say him for the best whether it is matter of learning or question of administration despite his hectic schedule as a rector of this big seminary he could be kind enough to oblige to moderate this seminar the institute owes you dear father a lot for your generous spirit thank you dear father on behalf of father anthony dias and father rector and all of you here i also express my gratitude to mrs estel for her generous spirit and sacrificial spirit for having kindly consented to come over here and she has come here and she is gracing the occasion thank you a special word of appreciation and congratulations in advance to brothers Thomas Berna sis Arokya Priya they have worked hard and brought out finest papers ready for presentation shortly we acknowledge their commitment and spirit of dedication thank you and congrats <laughs> sis Mary Nayak and brother Ajito deserve compliments for their significant contribution to this seminar through their powerful responses congratulations in advance brothers have a fruitful and enriching day dear friends thank you thank you dear father for your words of wisdom someone asked to define the family and the reply was family is the first for people to know you the ones who gave you the name the root from which you came and a place of love and strength 
A man without family is like a bird without feathers. Such was the role of family in individual's life as well as in the society. To address us on this beautiful topic of family, we have an eminent personality in the form of our distinguished guest, Mrs. Estelle de Souza. Mrs. Estelle de Souza is working as the Joint Secretary for the Differently Able at the regional level as well as the Archdiocese level of Bangalore. She worked as a counselor at the Christ University. At present, our distinguished guest is pursuing a doctoral studies on the topic Intervention for Children of Prisoners. May I now request Mrs. Estelle de Souza, our distinguished guest, to deliver the keynote address to the gathering and introduce the topic of the seminar. Good morning to you all. I've been coming to the seminary as a mother of a special child. Plenty of times I've come and addressed seminarians who are in their fourth year of theology and even some of them from the first year. But yes, day before yesterday when I got a call saying that to address it as a family, did I take a step back and think, oh yes, I'm a mother of a normal child too. So here I stand with pride and gratitude in my heart to thank all the fathers seated here for having me here to speak to you about the little I know about family. Family is not easy as Pope Francis, uh, Pope John Paul II from which church I belong to would say family is a sacred institution ordained by God which has mutual love and to be nurtured in respect. On the other hand, Pope Francis would say, marriage is always a gift. Marriage and life are not easy, but patience is the key to that. So I hope as I stand here, I would be able to address marriage and family. Marriage as a whole, if you see, is an institution which leads to the formation of a family. If you analyze it, the concept of marriage from the ancient context with its modern connotations has several questions to be answered. But the journey of marriage, or rather the voyage of marriage, transcends all these barriers and space and has far-fetched impacts on our implications of marriage today. At the same time, it also reveals that as an institution, marriage has gone, undergone a lot of changes to fit into the tune of today's life, that is the modern families, which as Father rightly said, there are a lot of changes where trust was the base of marriage, today there is infidelity. But that's not the end of it all. There is always a positive side where we can bring them back to the institution of marriage through counseling, through having a word, or even a listening ear. Marriage is the beginning of a lifelong commitment we make. It also provides growth for both of us, the husband and the wife involved, to be selfless and also to cater to the needs of the children we have. In the context of marriage is marriage, yes, but it's not only a physical union, but it's also, more importantly, a spiritual and also an emotional union. Because emotional connect to the person we have, the spiritual connect with the God who brought us together, are the ones which bear fruits of having children. And once having children, to bring them up in the faith that we have to bring them up to be worthy, to go, be called children of God. In olden days, there, was, there were praying families. It always says a family that prays together, stays together. So there were grandparents, aunties, uncles, all of them, either staying together or being close to, where the child is catered to with 
from the religious aspect. But in today's world, we have nuclear families where only the husband and wife are there. Do they have time for the children is a real million dollar question, which most of us don't have at the end of the day, for which we see from the church aspect, there are, we don't have the children of today. I'm telling, I'm not um, telling the ones who have respect, I'm telling the other population where there is no respect for the pastoral community, where they don't speak respectfully, they don't acknowledge their presence. I have been with a priest to a house which had only a child. The husband was an IT uh, person and the wife was a teacher. The wife had lost her faith long time ago because of certain things that was, there was unrest in the family because of which that it was. And the child saw to the parental pressures of education so he concentrated on education rather than the spiritual side of it. So as the priest entered the house, he was there. He said, I'll call my dad. And he went off never to come back. Even when the priest asked him to come to bless him, he said, I don't need anybody's blessings, which was a shock to me and to the priest because so far, I have never heard of that. So it was a shock. But for the priest, it was a shock for the spur of the moment. But he said, I have already heard it, Estelle. So yes, that is where we find fault with our own mission that we selected to be the pastors of our society that we are heading. But then as we go back to marriage, marriage has a lot of benefits within itself. It helps us in our well-being. It helps us in satisfaction and the greatest in today's world, stress management. Because no relationship comes without challenges. All relationship has its own challenges. But how we perceive each challenge is how victorious we are or how we attain our goals at the end of the day. Yes, in today's world, there are a lot of problems and issues, but as Pope would say, it's so important to listen, to listen. Husbands and wives need to communicate to bring happiness and serenity to family life. And yes, as I said, a listening ear is all that it takes, or a word of communication to say I'm late, is all that it takes to keep the husband or the wife at peace. But many a times in this modern running world, we do not have the time for that. Even to call up and say, I'm, I'll be late, you carry on with dinner. So there starts the problems. Then we don't recognize our own good locks. If we recognize, we would be able to face it. But Facing our faults, facing our challenges is where we bog down to pressures and there starts problems in the family. If we express ourselves constructively, even if it is a negative thing, I did not like what you do, what you did to me, rather than saying I hate what you say always would make a difference in that communication. It would give him or her a hearing ear to listen to what the tr trouble was. So expressing ourselves, acknowledging each other's love for one another, and also understanding that marriage is not a competition where you make more money or I make more money. It is both of us, it is ours. When it is ours, then everything holds good. The problems become ours, the victories become ours, the losings also in life become ours. But if that R is not there, if it's substituted with an I, their competition begins. Once competition begins, there is no end. 
If I take an example of my family life, I mentioned to you, I'm a mother of a special child. When I was in my sixth month, I came to know I was going to have a child who's going to be severely disabled, who is not going to attain any milestones. The doctors around me were always with one word, terminate. But I said, I need a week's time. And I sat at the feet of Our Lady and I cried to her, asking her whatever was the choice of my creator for me, I would do it. But if I have to terminate the child, that also I would do, but I require a sign. I prayed for a week. A couple of sisters from four congregations prayed for me for the same cause. But I stood on the seventh day, happy as I am today, 22 years ago, saying yes to the child. Next month, on the 16th, she completes 22 years. So my journey of 22 years wasn't an easy one, but it was a loving one, a memorable one, and a one that made me strong to say many times no to the world of today and yes to circumstances that bogged me down. So the journey began with me telling my husband that I want my child. And Vijay's only answer was, I'm so glad you want to have it. If it was a no, it would be difficult for me to make you say yes. But since it was a yes, it was, I'm very happy. And that yes stands even today. He is a better mother than me in many ways because that was the only voice which said yes to my child. So she is very attached to him, not because she's a girl, but because of that yes he said to her that day. And even today, many times we are not able to attend to many things. I do all this work just because he stays home, takes care of my little one. So I'm able to do this. His thing was, you overcame this. There are many, many mothers who are always subdued by the pressures of the husband for bringing children like this to the world. So I work along with these mothers, trying to empower them, trying to get surgeries, corrective surgeries for these children. So I stand here as a witness of a family that's gone through the roughest of times because certain people told me it was the curse, sin or the karma of my life that I, I became a mother of a child like that. No was my answer to all of them. Then my journey started with one priest who saw me the year before that as a bouncing young girl, laughing, enjoying life to a mother bogged down by the words of community saying that I'm a sinner, though I know I'm not. All of us are sinners, but God chose us to love us. So with his loving kindness and mercy, I'm not a sinner. So he held my hand from that day. It was March 21st, 2002 till the day he passed away. That was three years back, March 25th of 2020, I lost him. So my journey began along with him where he showed me what life was from the spiritual world, from the normal world, and to say no, be it a spiritual person in the religious world or a normal person from the outside world. Thanks to him for making me who I am today. And my husband, who I very much honor and respect for giving me the position, the space and the love I need to be who I am. So marriage is not a challenge. Marriage is not difficult if we have it taken in a positive stand. As um, Father had already mentioned, the apostolic ex ex exhortation, Familiaris Concerto, where Pope John Paul says, 
the services to those who wonder about the destiny of marriage and family. There are three types of families in our churches today. One which va values marriage and family and seek to live faithfully. The second is those who are uncertain and anxious and searching for the truth. The third, those who are unjustly impeded from living freely their family lives. So he says, supporting the first, illuminating the second, and assisting the third. I chose to assist the third because I have worked with children whose parents are in prison. For no mistake of theirs, they are stigmatized. That is why I chose that subject. And thanks to the people from Chennai, Hyderabad, and Kerala who assist me because I have to have a cross population of these prison children. An intervention to intervene to their mental status as to how to deal with the criticisms of today and the burdens of yesterday, the name they carry as prison, children of prisoners. And to conclude, I would always ask you all, tomorrow, you all are members who are going to be under taking up pastoral care. The church's pastoral response must be to involve helping and renewing the awareness of marriage as an irrevocable gift of God. Because that's a journey of reconciliation, which Pope says, marital love is inseparable from marriage, love, marriage itself, in which fragile and limited human love meets divine love, which is always faithful and merciful. So as you all enter into pastoral lives, into pastoral care, my only request to you all is cater to the ones who really need them, who are shaky in faith and in their own mental well-being. Because if we only stand with them and they know there is somebody to hear me, there is a hand to hold me during my troubled times, there is nothing much more needed than that, than the words of a priest. The words of a priest always holds a lot of importance as it did to my life. Because his simple words of telling, if you are a sinner, Estelle, then I am too. The only difference is my hands are blessed because of the oil that is put on your hands. Yes, I chose family life and I stand here proud and happy as a mother of children where sacrifices were made, but happy to say we have won many battles together. So I hope and pray to you all, be assured of our prayers for you, that you will be prayed for because you are most precious to us. You have chosen this path to become priests. And we always will be there with you all to assist you all in your difficult times because at the end, we all are humans. All the best, dear brothers. And I hope I have done justice to the topic I have been given. And I hope there is a takeaway for you all. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Truly an enriching keynote address. Thank you, Mrs. Estel de Souza, for verbalizing the importance of family and marriage, adding your own personal experience to it. Dear friends, it's time to be more attentive. Now, I humbly request the dignitaries, speaker, and the critic of the second session to occupy their respective seats just in front of grandstand to partake in the first session. St. John 23rd says, the family is the first essential cell of human society. And Pope Francis once said, I want to celebrate and support the institution of marriage and family at this critical moment in the history of our civilization. But in this 21st century, 
we find many threads for the family life. Here comes Brother Thomas Berna from Third Year Theology to present the paper on the topic Challenges of Family Today, Individualism as a Threat to Marriage and Family Life. I humbly request Rev. Dr. Richard Brito, Director of St. Peter's Pontifical Seminary to moderate the session. Family is the place wherein we are naturally related to each other and where we enjoy the most intimate relationship and bonding. And it is in the family that we learn to relate with others. And if, as Pope Francis says, creating cells for oneself and building walls for oneself and living individualistic life is the greatest threat to the family life. And family life has not just a kind of interpersonal relationship, but rather that sacred intimate relationship beginning with marital union of the couple and the same relationship is shared with the children. And if being related is what actually makes that bonding truly God-willed. Here comes Brother Thomas Berna to enlighten us on the topic how the individuality becomes a threat to family life as well as a kind of hindrance in marriage through the topic given to him, challenges of family today, individualism as the threat to marriage and family life. So welcome dear Father Thomas Berna and all the best. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Psalm chapter 131 verse 1. Dear fathers, brothers and sisters, I am very happy to present my paper on the topic Challenges of Family Today, Individualism as a Threat to Marriage and Family Life. A family can be identified as a small or large social group which is made up of parents, spouse, children and other relatives. Marriage is closely linked to the family. It is legal but also a social institute. In marriage, Two individual people, a male and a female, commit themselves to each other to live together and share their common interests, hobbies, etc. and they become one. However, today, family and marriage are threatened by various phenomena that can be from the external as well as the internal environment of the family. In today's world, Individualism is the basic ground for all the family problems. The main aim of this seminar paper is to highlight the real essence of the marriage and the family in the light of scripture and church document and enumerate individualism as a threat to family life. In the Oxford Dictionary, family is a group consists of one or two parents and their children. While the new Encyclopedia Britannica defines family as a group of persons united by ties of marriage and parenthood or adoption and consisting of a man, a woman and their socially recognized children and called an elementary family. This unit was widely held until recently to be the most basic and universal form of social organization. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that the family springs forth from marriage. Marriage is the foundation of every family society. The family considered by the church as a vital cell of the whole society and thus of the church. Therefore, it is also called domestic church. The biblical roots of marriage in Old Testament, according to the sacred scripture, God instituted marriage as a pinnacle of creation. On the sixth day in the creation, first creation story, the book of Genesis tells us, God created man in his image, in the divine image he created him, 
male and female he created them god blessed them and saying be fertile and multiply fill the earth and subdue it genesis chapter 1 verse 20 verses 27 to 28 in the second creation story god says that it is not good for a man to be alone i will make a suitable partner for him this suitable helpmate or partner was formed from the very rib of man and this woman was flesh of his flesh genesis chapter 2 verses 22 to 23 woman is man's equal in dignity and the one closest to his heart because man and woman were created for one another a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and two of them became one flesh genesis chapter 2 verse 24 Scripture teaches that marriage is not a mere human invitation but something God established from the foundation of the world sin not only brought about the break with God but it also ruptured the original communion between man and woman Adam and Eve blamed each other for what had happened and were now embraced by their nakedness the old testament shows how sin affected the goodness of marriage there was the polygamy of the patriarchs and kings moses allowed to divorce because of the people's hardness of heart deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 1 and matthew chapter 19 verse 8 men and women did not treat her one another with integrity honor and love as god has intended nothing less while sin spoils the goodness of marriage it did not destroy it in the new testament christians are new creation in church healed of sin and its effects marriage is also recreated and made new in christ Jesus tells us that in the kingdom of God the permanent union of husband and wife that originally intended can once more be realized Matthew chapter 19 verses 6 to 11 by the grace of the holy spirit husband and wives can now truly love and honor one another St Paul tells us that a marriage bears witness to the in dissolvable love of christ for his church thus husband should love their wife even as christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 to 26 wives too are called to love their husband as the church loves christ The Old Testament also shows how God taught his people to revere once more the institution of the marriage. God's covenant with his people was an image of the exclusive and faithful love of husband and wife. The prophets helped the people see that God had not intended husband and wife to be separated. The book of Ruth and Tobit bears witness to fidelity and tenderness within marriage. The song of Solomon shows how the love of man and a woman mirrors God's love for his people because marriage is placed within the saving mystery of Jesus Christ Catholic recognizes it as a sacrament it is a means through which husbands and wives grow in love for one another and for their children become holy and obtain eternal life the marriage in the teachings of church the catholic church teaches that marriage between the baptized is a sacrament pope leo 13th explain in his writings marriage moreover is a sacrament because it is a holy sign which gives grace showing forth an image of the mystical nuptial of christ with church in gaudiya mitzvah number 48 states God himself is the author of the marriage and has endowed it with various benefits 
and with various ends in view all of these have a very important bearing on the continuation of the human race on the personal development and eternal destin destiny of every member of the family on the dignity stability peace and prosperity of the family and of the whole human race pope john paul ii in familiaris consortio number 56 states that the purpose of the christian marriage is is to sanctify people to build up the body of the christ and finally to give worship to god catholic marriage is a covenant it is raised to the dignity of a sacrament by christ himself christian marriage has its foundation in baptism in the code of canon law number 1055 affirms the matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partner of the whole life and which is ordered by its nature the good of the spouse and procreation and education of offspring has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament between the baptized CBCA document notes that the Christian family which stems from the sacrament of covenant the family is one in which faith is lived in the concrete situation family in the teachings of the church pope john 23rd in his encyclical ad patri cathedram number 58 states that the christian family is a sacred institution the family is founded upon marriage freely contracted one and indissoluble must be regarded as a natural primary cell of human society the family is the primary cell of our society and it is a center of human enrichment it has the human dimension and supernatural or spiritual dimension in the human dimension the family is composed of human person who have basic needs which are fulfilled in the family in the spiritual dimension the family develops the other values such as love fidelity forgiveness justice and peace god created every person in his own image and likeness male and female genesis chapter 1 verse 27 therefore the family has a spiritual dimension familiaris consortio state it is willed by god in the very act of creation marriage and families are interiorly ordained to fulfillment in christ and have needed of his grace in order to practice the family values in the spiritual dimension of the family is further articulate in familiaris consortio the laity moreover by their particular vocation have the specific role of interpreting the history of the world in the light of christ according to the plan of god creator and redeemer from this it is clearly that the family has a task and responsibility of spreading the message of love of god for the humanity as the mission entrusted it to by god the definition of the encyclopedia britannica mentioned earlier says that the family is made up of group of person but Pope John Paul II defines that the family is community of person the family which is founded and given life by love is a community of person of husband and wife of parents and children of relatives the catechism of the catholic church reminds that the christian family is a communion of person a sign and image of the communion of the father and the son and the holy spirit family in the church document family is a domestic church the christian family is seen as a domestic church the conciliar document and lumen gentium number 11 teaches that in what might be regarded as a domestic church the parents by word and example are the first heralds of the faith with regard to their children the decree on the apostolate of lay people number 14 says that 
the mission of being the primary vital cell of society has been given to the family by god himself the, the document clearly points out the mission towards the church and society the family has the responsibility of educating its member in faith and moral justice among the family members and justice towards one another is one of the most important moral values to be practiced by the members of the family in day to day life one of the document of cbca on the role of christian family in modern world states that the family being the first cell of the church and society it is the ideal and congenial place of initial evangelization and catechesis the primary agent of education is social justice and the first seminary of priestly vocation indian families are large people of faith and their family life is must influenced by religion it will be no exaggeration to say that lives of people are largely influenced by a deep religiosity the family structure and interpersonal relationship among its member are variable according to place and cultural background of the families in short summary family is a sacred institution and community of person it is a center of human enrichment the responsibility of the family is to educate their children and promote the social values like equality justice and selfless mind the vision of the marriage and family is to fulfill the desire of the god's kingdom in the earth but currently we are living in one of the most modern society of all times people are only looking to have more freedoms and fewer responsibility to others because of the influence of culture even cbc i mentioned that the structure of the family and the interpersonal relationship varies according to the place and culture as the result they are becoming the self centered person the concept of individualism is more predominant among the couples what is individualism cambridge dictionary defines individualism as the idea that freedom of thought and action for each person is the most important quality of the society it is a concept or idea or behavior that each person should think and act independently each person or oneself is more important than the group and one should work for our own advantage it urges the person to strive for oneself self progress and personal achievements are prioritized creating a strong sense of free choice and self sufficiency is turn leading to competition between individuals individuality can be defined as someone's unique combination of personal qualities along with the idea that each person is unique and distinct in terms of individuality fitting into what it means to be an individualist an individualist thinks they should live their lives based on what they need and want as individuals as people different from all others a few common characteristics of individualistic person being dependent upon others is often considered shameful or embracing independence is highly valued individual rights takes center stage people often place a great emphasis on standing out and being unique people tends to be self reliant the rights of individual tends to take a higher precedence how individualism affect the marriage and family life maintaining harmony in marriage has been difficult since adam and eve two people trying to go their own wish separate ways can never hope to experience the oneness of marriage as god intended the prophet isaiah portrays the problem accurately more than 2500 years ago when he described basic human selfishness like this all of us like sheep have gone astray each of us has turned to his own way isaiah chapter 53 verse 
self-centeredness is possible the most dangerous threat to oneness in marriage it affects how we talk to each other how we divide responsibilities in the home how we resolve conflicts and even how we spend our time at last there is no harmony in the family individualistic effects of social media on family nowadays social media widely promotes the individual work it can be bring forth negative or zero interaction between siblings couples family members and parents children it creates to avoid the conversation between family members if everyone is always on their phone when they are together no one is paying attention to each other striping us of our ability to hear and see verbal or non verbal messages social media deprives family member of learning and modeling with each other's social cues interpersonal relationship skills communication and bonding it also make the family members less critical and absent minded in family issues kids who spend more time using technology and social media at a young age will have difficulty understanding in emotion and developing relationship with others they are in their own world social media destroys the family cultures and family values it can leads to it the decrease in quality time and relationship satisfaction individualism versus children emotion individualistic parents may influence their children in several ways on the positive side children may learn the importance of personal autonomy however there are potential negative effects as well the first emotional distance excessive individualism can leads to emotional distance between parents and children children might feel that their emotional needs are not being met due to parents focus on their own pursuit lack of guidance children might struggle with the decision making or lack of guidance if parents prioritize their own interest over pro- providing support and advice social skills children raised by highly individualistic parents might find it challenging to navigate social inter- interactions as they might not have learned the importance of compromise empathy and cooperation value system children might adapt an overly self-centered value system potentially disregarding the needs and concerns of others indip interdependence over emphasizing individualism might hinder the children's ability to understand and appreciate interdependence which is crucially for healthy relationship and community engagement It is important for parents to strike a balance between fostering individualism and providing emotional support, guidance and a sense of belonging to ensure their children in their emotional development. Individualism versus divorce. Individualistic tendency can sometimes contribute to divorce in the following ways: prioritizing personal needs a strong focus on personal needs and desires might lead individual to prioritize their own happiness over the needs of their spouse or the marriage as a whole this can create a sense of emotional distance and neglect within the relationship communication breakdown individuals who emphasize their own independence might struggle to communicate effectively or compromise in their relationship this breakdown in communication can leads to misunderstanding and unresolved conflicts which can ultimately erode the foundation of the marriage unrealistic expectation an individualistic mindset can lead to having unrealistic or self-centered expectation of a partner 
when these expectation are not met it can lead to disappointment and dissatisfaction and potentially driving a couple apart difficulty in compromise marriage requires compromise and consideration for the needs and wants of both partners excessive individualism might make it difficult for one or both partners to compromise leading to ongoing conflicts and an eventually breakdown of the relationship lack of emotional supports an individualistic mindset might discourage providing emotional support or seeking it from a partner leading to feelings of isolation and loneliness within the marriage focusing on external validation if an if an individual place high importance on external validation they might prioritize societal expectations or their personal image over the stability of the marriage it is important to remember that individualism isn't inherently negative and a healthy relationship can still thrive with individualistic traits however finding a balance between personal autonomy and the needs of the partnership is crucial for a successful and lasting marriage at last conclusion an individual is a basic unit whether it be in family community society or nation when this unit is corrupt it leads to corruption everywhere when a parents work for himself or herself he or she only benefits his or her own own self but when he or she consider the community in social growth individualistic approach urges a person to pursue personal goals while in the family this may at time be hard to achieve or sometimes even impossible to do so if we are in the state of individualistic we are building a future without pillars for the next generation it is not only to the family it is for everyone we are also include interdependence is good as saint paul said let the peace of christ rule in your hearts since as a member of one body you were called to peace and be thankful colossians chapter 3 verse 15 thank you and the threats your presentation not only transmitted information but has a transformational effect on the audience may i call upon sister mary nayak from third year theology your presentation he has successfully presented in his paper the meaning of family as well as the meaning of married life yes made it clear that family is a basic and vital cell of all social relationships and giving us the biblical background of marriage as well as the divine plan of marriage from the beginning he has presented marriage as a divine call for the life of communion communion of love this love is self giving and self sacrificing and act up imitation of jesus christ himself who gave himself for the people of god the church is bride presenting the teachings of the church on marriage and family he has enumerated the sanctity of marriage and the dignity of family life calling family has a sacred institution and a community of persons and communion of persons at the same time increasingly in the modern society the trend and the culture of growing individualistic attitudes and practices based on individual interest individual happiness and individual freedom as priority over others well being and self giving has posed a threat to family life i congratulate for your well prepared and well presented paper 
and I hope you will have better uh, answers during the panel session at the final session to answer if anyone has questions. Now hereby I invite Sister Mary Nayak to present a response of critical analysis of the paper presented by Brother Thomas Berna. Welcome Sister. and family. Marriage is the icon of God's love for us. Indeed, God is also communion, the three persons of Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit live eternally in perfect unity. God's grace enables between spouses the unity, and each one must set aside all illusions and accept the other as he or she actually is, says Pope Francis in The Joy of Love. Marriage is the intimate, inclusive, indissoluble communion of life and love entered by man and women at the design of the Creator for the purpose of their own good and the procreation and education of children. This covenant between baptized persons has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament, that is, intimate communion of life and love. Marriage is the closest and the most intimate of human relationships. It involves the sharing of the whole of a person's life with his or her spouse. Marriage calls for a mutual self-surrender so intimate and complete that spouses, without losing their individuality, become one, not only in body, but in soul. This is the reason many church documents have been released on marriage and family in order to educate the faithful, especially to youngsters. And I express my gratifying appreciation to Brother Thomas Berna for the meticulous and confident presentation and clear explanations on the topic. My positive observations towards the presentations are as follows. Good and authentic presentation. He has explored various sources to bring out an authentic presentation. Use of the language was clear. Usage of simple vocabulary makes everyone to understand the presentation easy. The explanations of the concepts was good. Scope of the presentation fulfills the essence that individualism is a threat to marriage and family life. Highlights of the concepts presented by my, with my reflection. At this juncture, I would like to express some of the highlighted concepts of the presentations that call for our attention family in the light of scriptures. In the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, be fruitful and multiply and fulfill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all creatures. And Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. These verses set forth the biblical pattern that marriage was instituted by God at the beginning. One man is united to one woman in matrimony and the two form one new natural family. In the Old Testament, the marriage of Christians is a sacrament by virtue of the spouse's baptisms. In other words, marriage is the living sign that truly communicates the love of Christ and the Church. The spouses' vows lived out in their daily commitment and most specifically in other one flesh union constitutes this living sign. As St. Paul says, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and join to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I mean that in reference to Christ and the Church, Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. Family, in the light of Church documents, 
Pope John XXIII in his encyclical Ad Patri Cathedral says, family is a primary cell of our society and a center of human enrichment. It has a human dimension and spiritual dimension. In the human dimension, family is composed of human persons who have basic needs which are fulfilled in the family. Familiaris Consortio states, marriage is willed by God in the very act of creation. Marriage and the families are interiorly ordained to fulfill fulfillment in Christ and have need of his grace in order to practice the family values. Individualism. Individualism is putting your own interests over those of others. I come first and you Everyone else comes second. Obviously, such an attitude undermines marriage, which depends on submitting to each other in love and service. Marriage, as God designed, it is all about being one in mind, in goals, aspirations, and commitments. Each partner in the marriage is to help each other to achieve the common good for which they are united in holy wedlock. How the individualism does affect the marriage and family? Individualistic characters of a person in the family may influence on children's emotions. It may also lead marriage to divorce. Individualistic is not an inherently negative and healthy relationships. However, Finding a balance between personal freedom and the needs of the partnership is crucial for a successful and lasting marriage. The above said points were clearly explained in nutshell. Therefore, unquestionably, this paper is a sincere attempt to, to bring out the challenges of family today. Individualism is a threat to marriage and family. Having said this, I would like to highlight some areas, the paper which could have been more precise and well brought out by bringing in some of the attractive comments. Comments about the presentations. Explanations with more reflection could have been of a greater help in understanding the concepts. In the first part, your exploration of the concepts of family is quite comprehensive. You have defined family according to both the Oxford Dictionary and New Encyclopedia Britannica, highlighting the role of parents, children, marriage, and parenthood. Drawing from Catechism of the Catholic Church, you have emphasized the connection between family and marriage. It's a great that you have also introduced the new term domestic church, reflecting the significance of the family within the broader context of society and the church. To enhance this section, you could have delved deeper into the historical evolution concept of family, various cultural definitions of family, and perhaps touched on the changing dynamics of family structures in modern times. Additionally, discussing the importance of family in transmitting values and tradition would add depth to your paper. In the second part of the paper, you have very well brought out the basic threat of a marriage and family life is individualism and the effects of the individualistic characters on families, mentioning that media is one of the cause for individualism and its pros and cons. In order to give more weight to your paper, I feel if you could have dealt on some of the internal and external reasons of individualism, as the post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Amoris Laetitia, states that certain attitudes that express the love and encourage the family life in Article 137 to 140, that is, listening patiently and attentively to the other partner, developing the habit of giving real importance to the other partner. Keep an open mind, show affection and concern to the other partner. New, never downplay the person. 
and finally you could have discussed some practical recommendations for individuals and families to navigate the challenges of individualism while fostering healthy relationships and a sense of responsibility towards the community to conclude marriage is a unique communion of persons and it is on the basis of this communion that the family is called to become a community of persons and what they express in the consent is essential to the common good of the spouses and they indicate that ought to be common good for the future family but currently we are living in one of the most individualistic society of all times people are only looking to have more individual freedoms and fewer responsibility toward other marriage rates are dropping the divorce rates are rising furthermore the fertility rate and the birth rate are in decline the individualistic frame of mind could hold back some people from marrying in the first place therefore it's a kind suggestion for most couples who do tie knot marriage is not individualistic it still means combining two lives into one interdependent partnership thank you sir meri naik for your clear and factual analysis of the paper it has certainly triggered new enriching ideas and i owe my special thanks to reverend dr richard brito director of st peter's pontifical seminary for moderating the session full thing god made so the bible tells us was the family he created man and woman and gave them everything he entrusted world to them pope francis continues saying about the marriage this is what marriage is all about man and woman walking together wherein the husband helps his wife to become ever more a woman and wherein the woman has the task of helping her husband to become ever more a man he suggests that marriage life has to be renewed each day because love is not easy here comes sister aroke priya from third year theology to chisel the beauty of the sacrificial love by presenting the paper on the topic sacrificial love commitment and fidelity as the secret of successful marriage and family life may i request reverend father vincent montero to moderate the session we heard the first session of today there are challenges there are difficulties all of us are aware of it but still we continue to live in a family it is said when the lock is manufactured by manufacturer key is manufactured along with it no lock is created without a key there are solutions for every problems answers for every challenges it is better to light a candle instead of cursing the darkness it's our duty to see do we have hope in this this small picture of family life today there are problems there are challenges but there are answers too so here comes reverend sister arukya priya of third year theology with her own views browsing through the scriptures documents and books to see is there a hope welcome dear sister thanks to one and all present here now i am here to present my paper as a solution to the problems in the marriage life on the topic sacrificial love commitment and fidelity as a secret of successful marriage and family life i would use the following abbreviations during my presentation ccc for catechism of the catholic church cc for kastikonubi gs for gaudium express 
F C for Familiaris Consortium and A L for Amoris Laetitia. Introduction. Christian marriage as a sacrament unites a man and woman to make a new family and grants them the grace to become a domestic church and to produce a new life for society. The family by the eternal bond of the marriage is a lifelong relationship. This is expressed in the words of consent, that is, I take you to be my spouse. I promise to be faithful to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, to love you and to honor you all the days of my life. These words of consent are the indispensable element that makes the marriage. CCC 1627 Pope Francis further adds that the exchange of consent cannot be reduced to the present. They involve a totality that includes the future until death do us part. AL 214 Sustaining the eternal bond of the marriage is to live the consent. Living this consent leads to the success of marriage. This paper is an attempt to present the essential elements for the successful marriage. The first element for the success of marriage is sacrificial love, which will be explored in detail from the scripture and the teachings of the church. Secondly, the success of the marriage is commitment. It will be explored how commitment expresses the mutual trust and love throughout the life of the couple. The third element which leads to the success of marriage is fidelity. It will be explored from the scripture and the teachings of the church. Sacrificial Love in the Bible a couple's expression of sacrificial love is the force that will hold them together because of the selfless love for one another in their marriage. Sacrificial love in a marriage manifests from both the individual for the good of the togetherness. It is essentially mutual, a shared giving persons to each other. Family life is presented in the Bible as a great religious importance and significance for society. The greatest gift is selfless love. Marriage and the family life are expected to signify and express it as a witness and profession of God's saving love. This is the grace and fruit of a marriage touched by the Holy Spirit. We find a great example of Elkanah's love for his wife Hannah. The situation is that Hannah was barren because the Lord has closed her womb. But Elkanah's love for Hannah never fades off. He gives a double-fold share of the sacrifices to her to take care of herself. Hannah is bitterly crying and is in anguish not merely because she is barren, but because she is not able to beget a child of Elkanah. Both Elkanah and Hannah are not self-centered. Instead, they have a sacrificial love for each other that they are selflessly taking care of and loving each other. 1 Samuel chapter 1 verses 1 to 8 The giving of oneself to the other is in order to sanctify the other and to be one. More even than one is bound to one's father and mother. Sacrificial love between the husband and wife is basic to family life and all the love relationship in the family. This is supported by the words of St. Paul which recommend mutual love and respect between Christ and the church. This can be described the life of a spouse or a parent who strives to live a life of sacrificial love within their family. Sacrificial love in the teachings of the church. Marriage helps to open oneself to the other, to mutual aid and to self-giving. CCC 1607 Sacrificial love is the foundation of a successful marriage and family life. 
the encyclical letter cc speaks of love in detail however it refers only to the conjugal love whereas the recent three documents we are going to refer speak about the sacrificial love first document gs speaks of the marital love between the partners like an affection between two persons rooted in the will at the same time the document explores deeper that such a love leads the partner to a free mutual giving of self experienced in tenderness in action and permeates their whole lives gs number 49 this is what we call as sacrificial love second the apostolic exhortation familiaris consortio which stands out at the very center of the pope st john paul the second catechesis on the family explores the meaning of sacrificial love as the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being fc number 11 such love is intimately tied to the concept of self gift and is constituted by the value of total self giving fc number 32 the love between husband and wife mirrors the life between christ and his church that is this love is sacrificial and life giving loving each other with the love of christ and their communion of love becomes a sacramental sign of christ's union with the church finally the recent post synodal apostolic exhortation amoris letitia the joy of love presents the family of nazareth as a model for the sacrificial love this family continues to illumine every family to face the challenges of life looking at it very positively every family despite its weakness can become a light in the darkness of the world ultimately marriage reveals divine love a love manifested in the total self gift of jesus who even now lives in our midst and enables us to face together the storm of life at every stage self giving love is heart of the family therefore sacrificial love is not conceptual or a philosophical notion but it is relational al 66 commitment in the bible from new testament as a model for all families the holy family shows us how to love each other commit to each other bear each other's burden and always forgive each other as the earthly parents of the child jesus mary and joseph provide the perfect couple and parenting models their commitment towards their family life exemplifies the spirit of love for christ that guided their lives husband and wives today would do well to imitate the honor love and devotion that mary and joseph had for their family as well as their whole hearted trust in obedience in god the relationship of marital commitment itself is seen as holy the couple's joint commitment to conduct their marriage is based on god's design and sovereign plan marriage represents a serious commitment that should not be entered into lightly or unadvisedly if sex is removed from the context of the marriage commitment sex becomes the superfluous object of hedonism the purpose of family is both to nurture the values of tradition and to transmit the commitment of for these to the next generation commitment in the teachings of the church marriage can radiate a fruitfulness of charity hospitality and sacrifice married couples through their commitment entail promise to love honor and support one another even in difficult times ccc 1654 marriage is the re- relationship of irrevocable personal commitment with the scriptural word covenant it indulges the principles like mutual help and service experiencing the meaning of oneness and recognizing how to live out the vocation of life in the apostolic exhortation familiaris consortio 
St. John Paul II speaks that the family is also a community of life in the way it exists and grows day by day. The members of the families are meant to communicate everything with one another, to be open in all circumstances, to trust undoubtedly, to share with love, to give without expectation. FC 15 In this sense, the commitment is the fundamental task of marriage and family is to be at the service of life. FC number 28 Implementation of Amoris Laetitia needs to focus on strengthening family bonds, preparing couples for the commitment of marriage, and fostering a culture of inclusion in life. Marriage is a lifelong commitment and an ongoing project that requires husband and wife to strive together to live their vows more perfectly in order to find success in their marriage life. The public commitment made in marriage is necessary for a free and faithful bond. Committed families make God's love present to the world in countless ways. Marital Fidelity in the Bible Since sex and procreation are ordained by God, proper use of these, proper use of these is a demand of God. Infidelity in marriage is therefore not only an offense against justice, but also an offense against God. This is illustrated in the case of Joseph in the Old Testament, who had his wife Asenath and their two sons Manasseh and Ephraim. Genesis chapter 41 verses 50 to 52. He was a good family man and a faithful husband. His fidelity was tested by the Egyptian Potiphar's wife. Still, Joseph did not give into the temptation. His assessment of the situation is very enlightening. In Christian family life, this is all the more relevant because Christ has made marriage into a sacrament, into a sacred sign of his own loving union with all the believers and source of supernatural life in his church. Another prominent figure for fidelity in marriage and family life is Tobias. When he married Sarah, everybody expected that he would die in the same way as her former seven husbands in the bridal room. But Tobias rose from the bed and said to Sarah, Get up, my sister. You and I must pray and petition our Lord to win his grace and his protection. They both prayed and lay down for the night. They were found sleeping and unharmed next morning. Tobias accepted Sarah and she accepted his as God's gift. This explains their reverence to one another and their strong tender love and fidelity. It is their fidelity to each other that kept the family in unity, love and happiness. The wife on her part should learn well her role in keeping her husband faithful to herself and to God. St. Paul says in his letters, the husband and wife are very much responsible for the fidelity of each other. Occasions for infidelity are plentiful in the world. It requires character along with the fear of God to keep conjugal fidelity, which is essential for a healthy family life. It may involve sacrifice. For Joseph, it costed his freedom of movement, but it was worth the praise. Fidelity in the teachings of the church. Fidelity expresses constancy in keeping one's word. God is faithful. The sacrament of matrimony enables man and woman to enter into Christ's fidelity for his church. Through conjugal chastity, they bear witness to this mystery before the world. CCC 2365. Pope Pius XI, in his encyclical letter, Kasti Konubi, describes the second blessings of marriage as fidelity. The definition of fidelity is given as unity, chastity, charity, and honorable, noble obedience. Fidelity, in the sense, is its own blessing. The chastity of husband and wife or exclusive sexual fidelity 
mirrors the love of Christ and the church. But this fidelity must become a love which goes beyond sexual intercourse. It must be a love in occasion, characterized as mutual perfection of the inner life imitating Christ. CC 22 and 23. The document Gautium Express speaks, by its very nature, conjugal love of man and woman requires of obligation and inviolable fidelity of the spouses. This is the consequence of the gift of themselves which they make to each other. The imitate union of marriage as a mutual giving of two persons and the good and good of the children demands total fidelity from the spouses and requires an unbreakable union between them. GS number 48 St. John Paul II says, The communion that was made between them during their marriage urges them to strive for fidelity. <coughs> because marriage is a sacrament, it promotes an indivisible unity and indissoluble communion. St. John Paul II states, The first communion is the one which is established and which develops between husband and wife by virtue of the covenant of married life, the man and woman are no longer two, but one flesh, and they are called to grow continually in their communion through day-to-day -day life. Fidelity to their marriage, promise of total mutual self-giving. FC number 19. A number of times in Amoris Laetitia, Pope Francis refers to the fidelity of marriage as being a great and mysterious gift, quoting the words of St. Robert Bellarmine, the fact that one man unites with one woman is an indissoluble bond and that they remain inseparable despite every kind of difficulty, even when there is no longer hope for children, can only be the sign as a great mystery. AL number 124 Conclusion The present world is in a desperate need of education on the successful marriage life. The cases of divorces in the civil court and the marriage tribunal cases are increasing daily. There are cases of marriage breakdowns of couples who have lived many years together and also the couples whose marriage has taken place only in weeks time. The couples are in dire need of teachings of the church which insists on the development and strengthening of a couple's marriage life by exercising their sacrificial love, fidelity and commitment. These three elements are indispensable for a successful marriage of life. The younger generation of the present times, especially in our country, have adopted the western culture of living together relationship. By this relationship, the youngsters do not want to be committed to each other by love and fidelity. This is the major issue concerning morality. This lifestyle is not leading the couples at most times to marriage. This cultural changes has also influenced and has affected the married couple in a way they wait for a chance to break the marriage and move on with whomever they like. The married couples should rule out this culture and be adapted to sacrificial love. <coughs> sacrificial love should be the lifestyle of married couples to make the marriage bond stronger each mom moment of their life. Commitment should be their pledge in order to be supportive and committed to one another in all walks of life that their commitment in one to one and one for one. And finally, Fidelity should be like their heartbeat. If the promise to fidelity, not only in terms of sexual matters, but also in all the openness of their life is broken, then the marriage life is dead. A successful marriage is the fruit of the roots, that is, sacrificial love, commitment and fidelity. Thank you, one and all. Comments and the popular writings of the theologians and the fathers of the church. Well knit, a flow up theme, and also 
you have taken jesus way of countering the challenges we have on the screen a citation from jesus what god has put together let man not separate this was the situation we know when he was asked what is your opinion about the divorce because moses has already said it's okay you can give a certificate of divorce and uh, be separate jesus says it was not so in the beginning go to the original the intention of god was that they should live together till the end of their life so we too have to take that way for sister suggestion we know the main challenge for family was the selfishness or individualism then the answer also that selfless love or sacrificial love thank you sister for that wonderful presentation now we have uh, brother ajito xavier with a response just to appreciate sister for that wonderful presentations and also to see whether it could have been better in particular places welcome brother the content you have presented discusses the importance of sacrificial love commitment and fidelity in a successful marriage and family life it draws reference from the bible and the teachings of the church to support these principles overall the paper seems well structured and well researched exploring the topic from both scriptural and doctrinal perspectives your introduction provides a solid foundation for discussing the essential element of a successful marriage it clearly outlines the context of christian marriage as a sacrament highlighting the lifelong commitment and the significance of consent your introduction sets the stage by highlighting the sacredness of christian marriage and the eternal bond it represents you have incorporated key references from the catechism of catholic church and pope francis teachings which add credibility and depth to your discussion your exploration of sacrificial love in the bible is well articulated and highlights the essence of selflessness within marriage and family life your emphasis on the mutual nature of sacrificial love and its significance in maintaining a strong bond is noteworthy to enrich your content you could have expanded on the idea of sanctification you might include 1st corinthians chapter 7 verse 14 where it is mentioned that the unbelieving spouse is sanctified through the believing spouse this concept reinforces the idea that the love between spouses has a transformative and sanctifying effect additionally drawing from passages that emphasizes the role of sacrificial love within the family dynamic such as colossians chapter 3 verses 18 to 21 could further support your points these passages addresses the relationships between husbands and wives as well as parents and children highlighting the importance of selflessness in maintaining harmony and love within the family you have provided a comprehensive and insightful overview of the church teaching on sacrificial love in the context of marriage and family life your analysis of the documents including kasi konubi gaudium et spes familiaris consortio amoris Leticia demonstrates a deep understanding of the concept and its significance. It is also worth to note the encyclical Humanae Vitae, 
which discusses the importance of self giving love within the context of marital relationships and emphasizes the the inseparable connection between love and the transmission of life your ability to connect these teachings to practical aspects of family life and the divine love exemplified by the holy family adds a meaningful layer to your appreciation of the topic the way you emphasize the relational nature of sacrificial love encourage christ centered marriages showcases your grasp of the subject essence you your insights on commitment in the bible and its relevance to family life are thought provoking the use of the holy family as a model showcasing love commitment mutual support and forgiveness is indeed a powerful example for all families to emulate expanding on commitment you could draw from ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 to 12 which speaks about the strength of companionship and the idea that a cord of three strands is not easily broken this could illustrates how commitment to each other and to god creates a strong bond within marriage additionally proverb chapter 3 verse 3 to 4 could be mentioned as a biblical perspective on commitment let love and faithfulness never leave you bind them around your neck write them on the tablet of your heart then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of god and men this can be tied to the commitment within a marriage as a source of favor and honor your discussion on commitment in the teachings of the church is thorough and insightful you have highlighted the concept of commitment within marriage beautifully emphasizing its role in radiating charity hospitality and sacrifice your inclusion of reference from the catechism of catholic church adds a solid foundation to your points expanding on your content you might consider incorporating a reference to the sacrament of matrimony itself drawing from the code of canon law canon number 1057 which states that marriage is a covenant by which a man and a woman established between themselves a partnership of the whole of life and which is ordered by its nature to the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring in addition the concept of commitment as a fundamental aspect of marriage can also be connected to the vows exchanged during the wedding ceremony quoting specific wedding vows are referring to the traditional promises made by the couple could strengthen your points regarding the implementation of amoris letitia in your local context you might consider adding some specific examples how how these principles have been applied and the impact they have had on strengthening family bonds and promoting a culture of inclusion your presentation on marital fidelity in the bible is well founded and offers meaningful insights you have effectively highlighted the importance of fidelity within marriage and family life drawing upon biblical examples such as joseph and tobias these examples showcase the principle of commitment trust and the role of faith in maintaining marital fidelity to enhance your content you might consider by stating relevant biblical verses that directly addresses fidelity and the sanctity of marriage for instance hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 states let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for god will judge the sexual immoral and adulterous this verse 
could be connected to your points on the sacredness of marriage and the implication of fidel infidelity additionally you could explore passages from proverbs that discuss the value of fidelity and the consequences of infidelity proverb chapter 5 verses 15 to 20 for example provide guidance on how marital fidelity contributes to a happy and fulfilling family life furthermore you might consider discussing the concept of two becoming one flesh as mentioned in genesis chapter 2 verses verse 24 this can be tied to the idea that infidelity disrupts this unity leading to a breakdown of trust and emotional bonds your discussion on fidelity in the teachings of the church is comprehensive and well structured you have provided a clear definition of fidelity as constancy in keeping one's word and tied it to god's faithfulness your use of Catechism of Catholic Church number twenty three sixty five as a reference adds a solid foundation to your discussion. The encyclical Casti Conubi of Pope Pius the Eleventh and its elaboration on the blessings and the components of fidelity, such as unity, chastity, charity, and obedience, gives depth to your analysis. the connection you have made between conjugal chastity and christ's love for the church underscores the significance of fidelity in marriage your reference to casi conubi number 22 23 in this context adds credibility to your argument additionally your mention of gaudium et spes emphasizes the obligation and inviolable fidelity within the conjugal relationship the document references provide support for your statements and strengthen your overall discussion your inclusion of saint pope john paul the second's perspective on marriage as a sacrament that promotes unity and communion as well as his quotes on the continual growth of communion through fidelity enriches your analysis your reference to familiaris consorcio number 19 solidifies your points lastly your connection to pope francis statement in amoris letitia especially the reference to saint robert bellarmine's word brings a historical and theological depth to your exploration of fidelity furthermore you might consider discussing sacramentum caritatis apostolic exhortation by pope benedict the 16th in paragraph number 27 which reflects on the eucharist and its connection to marriage it emphasizes the importance of spousal unity and fidelity as a participation in christ's love your conclusion effectively summarizes the key points you have discussed in your analysis of the teachings of the church on successful marriage you highlight the urgent need for educating couples on these principles especially in a world where divorce rates are increasing by emphasizing the importance of sacrificial love commitment fidelity you have underlined the foundation on which a successful marriage is built your comparison of fidelity to a hard beat adds a vivid and relatable metaphor to the concept the way you have presented these elements as essential and interconnected aspects of strong marriage demonstrates a clear understanding of the subject matter the conclusion effectively encapsulates the main idea you have discussed throughout your analysis and provides a meaningful takeaway for readers your content is well organized and in fact impactful incorporating these references and practical examples could enhance the depth and 
practicality of your discussion on the key element of a successful marriage your understanding of the subject matter is evident and your emphasis on sacrificial love commitment and fidelity is valuable in promoting healthier marriages thank you now that both the papers put together give us a beautiful picture of solution to the challenges of marriage so let's all put our hands together for both of them and applause for them for their wonderful presentation thank you for your deep analysis on the paper my sincere thanks to reverend father vincent montero for moderating the session our world is full of diamonds and gems and we have two of them amidst us as our guests mr roshan manages and mrs sandhya manages here i request de dear sir and ma'am to enlighten the young minds with your inspiring and enriching experience in the beginning you need two hearts and a diamond in the end you are searching for a spade and a club <laughs> dear reverend father richard father lawrence mrs estel reverend fathers brothers sisters good morning everyone and uh, thank you for that kind words of introduction of us i really don't know to what extent that we are invited here as a couple who can share much more on family life but we are honored and it is indeed much more responsibility for us to live a good christian married life um well my wife sandhya and i would like to share a few of our personal aspects of marriage and what has brought us to where we are today and uh, so between both of us we decided to share some of our thoughts on some very important aspects that we believe have helped us in our married life sandhya and i have been married for the last 26 years and we are blessed with two boys one of 25 all of 25 and the younger one at age 21 the older one his name is tapan and he has completed his education his higher studies and has joined us in our profession and my youngest son tejal he pursues his post graduation at christ university to tell us tell you a little more about ourselves and how we are here and what's our background um Sandhya is uh, from the city of Manipal in Udupi district Dakshin Kannada. She hails from a family of uh, educators. Her mother Mrs Elvira retired as the headmistress of the Manipal Junior College and father uh, my father-in-law late uh, Dr Alvin De Souza. Uh, he retired as the principal of Mahatma Gandhi Memorial College the MGM college famous college in Udupi. and he was also the author of several chemistry textbooks of which i have had the honor as a student to be studying one of his books he was a professor in chemistry and his chemistry books is what i studied i think our chemistry began from that time itself reading is uh, you know understand at least did i realize one day i'll be marrying the author whom i am studying his books his own daughter but that's a different story uh coming to me my family hails from mangalore but settled in bangalore my father worked in the railways um uh, and my mother a teacher from st aloysius or teaching at st aloysius in mangalore and after marriage she moved down to bangalore and the teacher in her didn't keep quiet she needed to do something and she moved on to begin her own institution uh began with a very small number five students one teacher one classroom and uh, today we are blessed that we are in our 56th year of establishment my father moved on from his job a government job to support my mother and uh, i have watched them go through the different struggles to set up the institution in various ways and today we run right from the kindergarten to the pre university uh, with the strength of almost 3000 odd students and uh, different courses at the puc level and we are in our 56th year of our establishment we run under the name of kamal high school and pre university college in basveshnagar in bangalore in um 
1997, after our marriage, we got married on the 10th of May in 1997. Um, we both joined our parents, my parents at work. And um, in 97 October, my, my father passed away very soon after our marriage. So it was hardly three months of time that he, we were able to spend as a married couple. And um, I had to take on the responsibility of running the institution because by then I was working alongside with him, but it was all of a sudden that it happened and I had to take on the responsibility. Um, for us both, we grew not only in our profession as we, we jumped into our profession of work, but we also grew in our marriage uh, taking on the challenges at that young age of 27, 23, 24, uh, as, as young as we were when we got married. And with the responsibility of running an institution, uh, we had to handle several uh, issues around us as a family. There is no sure formula for a very successful or a happy married life. There is no one size fits all kind of a formula for a married life. In my experience, I have seen several relationships. I have witnessed my own parents' relationships through all difficulties, through good times, through the times that we were all brought up. I have observed and seen the relationship of my own uncle, aunts. So somewhere, personally for me, I had created for myself something what I would want to be as a married person. And I feel that is very important in having a clarity of the purpose of marriage. Very often, we are just, as a sister read out, somebody after many years have divorced or somebody within a week are married. Well, we need to have a clarity of purpose. A marriage is a marriage, a commitment for life, and it's not just a year's affair and that we move on. So my first observation and advice to all young couples would always be, be sure of what you are getting into marriage. What is it that you want or expect from a partner? And have a clarity with the other person what exactly you want. For me, I was lucky. Sandhya also had a very clear purpose of marriage. Yes, as Roshan said, uh, we got married in 1997. And I would say our journey of married life since then has not been a very smooth one. We have had our share of humps where we have crossed, especially the difficulties were more in the initial years. As Roshan mentioned, we both are in the field of education. And in our marriage life, we were just discovering ourselves in the initial years in 97, because ours was an arranged marriage. And in arranged marriage, we take some time to get to know each other. As we were still in the process of getting to know each other, we had an unforeseen situation that came up, that is Roshan's dad passed away within five months of our marriage. And Roshan was her barely 27, and the entire responsibility of the school was on him. And everybody was looking at how will they manage now? Will they be able to take it on? You know how it is. People have to trust us to see two young people come forward and how will they manage the entire responsibility. And at the same time, on a personal front, I was carrying my older son, who was five months, and also we had to take care of Roshan's mom, who was mourning at that time. But then I think we went through it. And there were two things that I can recollect what helped us to go through the situation. First one, coincidentally, is in line with what Sister Arukya Mary said. We did sacrifice our almost three years from all sorts of social life, from all other, usually young couples when they're married, look forward to spending a lot of time together, having fun, enjoyment. But for us, it was more towards, focused towards the family. And that's what we did. But that gave us more time to be together. And that's how our love grew together. Secondly, as 
It is seen in the recent years there are many marriages that break especially in the initial years. And one of the foremost uh, reasons is I think it's also I was just reading uh, an article and even in Goa it was the statistics say one of the most uh, reason where marriages are breaking is due to the influence of other family members on the newly married couple. As much as family is required, the support of other family members are required, we both were there for each other so strong that we didn't allow anything else come in the way of our marriage. And I think these two reasons helped us to go through it. As you all know, crisis makes us stronger. And that crisis actually helped us to be together. Our love grew, our respect for each other grew, and definitely we trusted each other. And in the initial years, I think the foundation was laid for our marriage on which our marriage stands now. And as Roshan said, it's now 26 years and we owe it all to our initial years. We still remember in the homily when father spoke, the main celebrant, Father Eric from Holy Ghost Church, who uh, was the main celebrant and uh, at the homily he said, you have to be the made for each other couple. Those days in 97 there was a campaign uh, you all are too young. Uh, uh, the ITC group had uh, introduced a campaign as for a made to each other couple and that kept ringing in our mind and I don't know if we are still made for each other but definitely we are not mad at each other. So our, our marriage definitely has grown and we are happily married. <coughs> Uh, sharing with you some of the important aspects of uh, upbringing as the family developed and grew, bringing up our children and how that impacted us. Um, one of the early decisions we took as a couple was the upbringing of our children. No doubt, all of us, we are all today what we have experienced from our childhood. For us both, too, there have been uh, very contrasting experiences. But Sandhya felt that there are certain areas that were best handled by me. So right from the beginning, for my older son, say from the age three upwards, a certain system of discipline was introduced. Be it a eating pattern, eating timings, his sleeping pattern, recreation time, studies, it all began to have a routine and that helped. You know, I recall a funny incident because of the routine that we set into our son and later on even our second boy. That when we went to visit a family over dinner and they also were a young couple having kids almost the same age. As early as 9 p.m. at night when we were still having a few words discussion, these children were playing in their room. My friend's uh, children came running up to me and said, uncle, uncle. Tapan is not playing with us. I said, why, why not? He has gone to sleep. He says 9 o'clock every day he sleeps and he's gone to sleep in our room. Who is playing with us? So we realized that that pattern that we set in him was so evident that it became a part of his lifestyle. But it's a good thing to have, especially when the uh, next day is a working day or a school day. Uh, having a kind of a system is very important. Um, that overall system that we've introduced in our children uh, still runs in them even though as old as they are. I won't say it is the same, but definitely they have imbibed in themselves this kind of a practice to have a systematic way of doing things and that helped a lot. I say that because the support that we gave for each other. It is difficult to implement these kind of routines and have a discipline at home when one of the other spouse is a little, uh, you know, who compromises on this situation. So that's where I had or we had a support for each other. Then there is that phase also when uh, the father is the hero. Dad is my hero. Whatever I say, whatever I do, ah, dad is the best. He knows everything. How he knows everything, he doesn't know that I don't know much, but whatever I say is right for him. So it is that phase which I enjoyed the most as dad is the hero, but it also gave me a lot of responsibility to be a role model. 
it is very important that what i say what i do has an impact because it is a life forming experience for my son so that brought about a lot of personal sacrifice that we had to do as sandhya said there are so many occasions that we may have had to attend which we would have as a younger couple or make some alternate arrangements for our children and say that we would still be there but um, somehow we took it as mutually agreed that certain occasions we would not comp compromise on not being around for our children and that happened mutually because sometimes it is difficult if the spouse has other interests we made it an understanding between us as well not to interfere in certain issues or handling of situations so although i would have been fairly harsh or stern or possibly an emotional scene created by the children to gain some support sandhya would not interfere and vice versa certain areas that she would be good at handling and the boys would look out to me for support i would not interfere either because we made it an understanding either one of us attended and attend to it completely in either ways i you are good or bad but one of us take on that role challenges were plenty about finances gadget requirements their friends time as they grew up as coming into slowly during teenage and oh i must say we are really happy that we have sailed through that tough period no doubt there were conflicts and arguments about how much liberty that they needed to be given but we both stuck through a very disciplined system with some kind of grumbling and long faces of the children they had to be you know uh, listened they listened to it and today in their young adulthood they are quite happy that we have been firm with them um just yesterday um, you know even with regard to um, open there's generally an open communication also regarding uh, sex education at home especially during the teenage although it has not been a typical classroom situation where we'll sit down and say okay son listen this is how things happen in life this is how you get attracted and this is what you should do and what you should not do it hasn't been that kind of an you know situation but whenever there was some kind of a little doubt a little bit of um, uneasiness in their behaviors or actions we knew something was in their mind we would make it a point to sit and talk to them through it and make them feel comfortable to express their thoughts or ideas about anything related to the opposite gender or what they needed to know about the general ways of life much before or much more than more of what social media or their friends could share with them although a little uh, squamish at first the boys would feel a little uneasy i have to ask this or talk to this in front of my dad how will he take it if i talk about anything that is personal to him now uh, it became a little easier for them and uh, accepted that these facts are okay to know it is nothing wrong at an early age that you know certain adult level facts but how you deal with that how you use that information and how you project that in public is very important we see that now from the point of view of how they empathize with their friends especially female friends we we can observe that their relationship around them is very good they understand certain situations of the girl of the female and how they should behave and what they shouldn't do and what the other boys shouldn't do i think that's a very nice quality that we observed in them a sense of empathy allowing or exposing them to the certain rights was a good decision we made at age 12 what they could do or use in terms of time or gadgets then at age 15 18 what rights they could have like pocket money uh, gadget use then at age 18 their right to own a gadget spend a little more time with friends and then age 21 their right to set a set or sit with the adults when we are sitting around with a glass of beer maybe or um, drive a vehicle or maybe a late night once or twice in the month was permitted so it has helped them to understand that what they get at what age they get has more value and meaning rather than get something well advanced in time and just earn it as what they did without having to be working for it um 
so much so that even now my son thinks that at every age he has the rights to be doing certain things. My son who is aged now 25 years looks at me and says, Dad, now I'm 25. Do I have the right to make a serious girlfriend? He keeps asking me. So I say, yeah, yeah, I know. But please remember where your serious girlfriend will end up in and be aware of the next stage of life that you have to take on. Yeah. So I share this from a perspective of children upbringing with a view that it is very important that the spouse, the family, that is the husband and wife, are together into whatever decisions that make up the upbringing of children. Because as we read, as we see, there are so many children who are moving in different tracks as early in life because of the influence of peers, influence of, of uh, media, and the lack of the involvement of parents. This is from our experience at work that we see thousands of students and their situations at their homes, which we counsel a lot. And that has helped us to frame for ourselves how we could be a better uh, role model to our children. I would continue about clarity in areas of work. As we all shared with you all that we work together. So our workplace is more or less the same. We live together, so the same house. So to avoid any sort of conflicts, we have made certain things very clear. We have defined our areas of work. Initial years, since both of us were pretty much new to the entire working space, we did work together. And a lot of projects that we took on, we could co complete it successfully. But as years went by, we realized it's better not to get into a routine of just being together rather than have a way in where we normally discuss. We discuss what has to happen and the final decision lies either with Roshan when it comes to school projects, he takes care. When it comes to the pre-university college, whatever comes up, final decision, I take care. But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is we respect each other from point of view of whatever final decisions that we each other have taken. So what happens is no third person can take advantage of the situation because they know that both of us are aware of what is happening. And this has helped us, especially at the workplace. And at home, we do have divided all our areas of work. I think being a working mom that helps out and where everyone puts in their bit and makes a regular day routine easy for us. And this didn't begin just now, but then from the beginning, we involved our children in small jobs, whatever they were able to do. And today, I must say we are a team of four of us, but divided into two teams. My son and I, my older son and I, ensure that the cooking and uh, the food is taken care and the two of them, Roshan and Tejil, take care of the clearing, cleaning. So it's basically... Just interrupt here. Um, 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 I, am, I am used to, uh, habituated now to having a scotch every day at uh, dinner. I have one scotch before I have uh, my meals and then I have a scotch bright afters to wash the vessels. Yeah. That's his so, incentive, okay? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's how it goes on. Yes. So it's basically is we have a lot of bonding during this time of uh, the work that we take on. And I would share one secret. I think for men to get work done, all that you have to do is just a few words of praise. You say that you've done your work done. My work is done. And that's how it goes on at home. But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to drive is that I think it's nice to involve the children in the part of the home work because in earlier days when I grew up, it was a taboo to see that boys are working at home. When the girls are there, when the daughters are there, why should the boys come into the kitchen? So that's how we grew up in our generation. But I'm happy that uh, those thoughts uh, with those thoughts, we didn't continue, but then our boys and Roshan and all of us together put in whatever possible to see that everything is taken care of at home. Yes. Um, we are not an ideal family. 
certain conflicts issues do rise up there is no human relationship without conflict and i must say that we have had our own fair share of conflicts as well i must confess i am the more stubborn of the two of us when it comes um and um to moving on i i get stuck but sandhya is that cool level headed person and acts as if nothing has happened we've had arguments on several issues be it at work or home but with a few discussions and debates it gets resolved and we move on conflicts like that very long lasting conflicts are very rare and the maximum i can say that we've held a issue between us is just overnight maybe because i was late at home to con to continue our discussions but next day we have resolved our issues for one we handle it this way for one we tell each other regularly that we need to talk it out if anything is bothering us i am never the one to take anyone else's views or opinions there are several occasions where different people come up with different thoughts and their opinions put but i i am not the one to take it at face value and i would rather hear it from the person concerned this is at all times at work as well as at home but because it's a practice at home it becomes a part of me um i am never the one uh, never the one to take someone else's version or information rather i confront the issue up front and i talk it out till the matter is clear between between us we do not bring up matters of the past and talk on the issue only at hand postponing our discussions has led to frustration and accumulation of fresh hurt so we've decided and follow that we thrash out the issue as soon as it is possible there are times it needs for one of us to compromise and on hindsight i must say sandhya is the one who compromises much more than me because she is ready to move on but then i am also learning from her how to be more forgiving one of our secrets has been listening fully to what each other each of one of us has to say before we come to a conclusion there have been several occasions where i have come with a preconceived idea or a judgment already on a particular issue but having heard her out i change my perspective because then i practically know what would have happened that's where most of us as my observation most couples miss out on giving each other a patient listening so we put it into practice and we advise each other let's hear each other out and then decide any issue that comes up and finally it um, after all the issues that we have and want to resolve it only takes a tight hug with each other that everything is settled sometimes we have arguments or sorts and we do it in front of our boys as well we have a lot of arguments when we talk on any topic we argue it out in front of our sons i'm happy we do it because they are also learning on how things are being dealt with by their parents we also show how we make up we have a open hug which gives them the idea all is well nothing to worry and we see it also in them that whenever there's an issue it is resolved and we end it up in a very warm note so we need to be as ideal pair as ideal as possible in a role model that we need to be for our children especially when we want well formed young adults with good emotional quotient after all the problems are settled we have a policy to keep our marriage happy and exciting after a quarrel we've decided to go out for dinner twice a week so twice a week we go out for dinner sandhya goes out on tuesdays i go out on thursdays so i saw reaction when he said twice in a week no so anyway taking forward from there yeah you may be wondering how do you live with a person who is so different from you it could be openness it could be tolerance but i think more than anything i think it is acceptance our mutual love has grown for each other because we have accepted each other as we are a man and a woman have a lifetime of trying to figure one another out and maybe possibly god made couples this way to keep boredom at bay otherwise i think life would have been boring if both of us would think the same we are so different that he is not afraid to take risks 
but i am too practical he is rational and i am quite impulsive he can't work in a hurry and do things fast as i can he is a very carefree evening bird he can sit on but i am an early morning bird he loves food and now he has made me a foodie too we both believe in discipline but we have different ways of handling for our kids so with so many differences we are still able to move on smoothly because as roshan said we have set some ground rules the foremost being we never bring mistakes of the past so we leave it there once it's done so no reminder of the mistakes of the past will definitely help us to move on forward and secondly we never go to sleep with an argument which is not complete so we try and see that before we get go to sleep that the day before the day that everything is settled to a large extent and i think this has helped us to live together happily though both of us are very different uh given our general social status uh, we are invariably involved in a few social and religious organizations besides some of the professional affiliations sandhya and i are members of a few social groups like the canra catholic association kca the canra entrepreneurs ke and our most favorite the christian family movement cfm you may have heard of the cfm a small christian community affiliated with the archdiocese of bangalore this movement is our favorite because it is very non formal very supportive and above all involves family cfm runs in three cities in goa mumbai and bangalore bangalore being the largest it has groups of families across the city area wise in rajajinagar we are a family of eight we are a group of eight couples more or less the same age group with our children also in the same age group we discuss important issues that affect family and children and the elders and openly discuss how each family handles the crisis or the issue at hand we have a chaplain a priest who moderates our discussion and ends with the interpretation of the issue from the point of view of the church these interactions have helped us grow as a family taking in the experience of all the members thereby strengthening our bond and support for each other the children are also involved in these discussions and helps us to understand their perspective thereby giving us all across the generations the way to peacefully coexist for sandhya and i we have benefited immensely and uh, gives immensely from the cfm and this gives us an opportunity to uh, counsel and help the younger parents on parenting skills all these are very important for a very balanced social work family life we are not very spiritually inclined i must say but we believe strongly in the presence of jesus christ in our life we may not follow a set pattern or recite a set of prayers but when it comes to praying we do so spontaneously all of us as a family and acknowledging the presence of god in all our success and whatever we do each of us in the family takes turn to speak spontaneously a prayer of acknowledgement and gratitude to god and to people who have been part of our life sunday mass is regular a uh, visit and the fellowship that we share after the mass is very enriching for us and that makes us a very happy and complete family this is very important affiliation to a social life because it is important as a couple when we move on we must go beyond just ourselves as knowing what we or thinking what we doing is right only when we move with others when we mix with a larger group and we feel and see the situations we either are happy that we are doing well or we are learning ways in which we can handle situations better and that situation or learning brings us together closer as a couple as well and actually we are able to bear one another's weaknesses and grow from each other's strength we are able to forgive one another's feelings 
and we have been patient and cheerful in spite of worries and problems both at home and school only because as much as we have shared whatever our life is but we strongly believe it's only because we believe that lord has always been with us at all times and we strongly feel the presence of christ in every situation in the worst of the times and at the best of the times that is one thing we all believe very strongly at our home and when we also believe that when god has forgiven us so many times in our life and he hasn't kept account of our mistakes then we too can forgive each other and move on with this in mind we see that our children also get into that routine of immediately solving situations whatever come up and that's what we feel that we have done in whatever way we could but there's lots more that we need to do to make our home a happier place well in conclusion i would say that it's uh, not that we are an ideal family definitely not they can never be one but it's just that we enjoy what we are doing and we acknowledge everyone's contribution to our family life i'm sure sandhya and i have a very long way to go but we are happy so far um there is a state i would really like to be there i recall a situation of uh, a very a very a little tragic one where a friend of mine a young couple um after long years of marriage they they got a ch uh, child a son and one day they were so happy and were elated that they had a boy and when the child was around 2 years one day it so happened that the father my friend was in a hurry he was rushing to work and he observed a bottle of medicine uncapped kept over there at the site so he hurriedly told his wife i'm on my way to office please ensure that you'll cap the bottle and keep it away from the sun the wife said ha ha but in her hurry uh, you know in involved in her work at home and all the housework she forgot to to cap the bottle and invariably the little one crawled towards the bottle and seeing its colors and fascination he drank the medicine it was a adult medicine adult dosage and it was quite fatal for him when he fell down the mother rushed him to the hospital and by then he reached there the little boy passed away my friend was distraught the father rushed to the hospital and seeing his little son lying dead there and the wife was fearful what will i answer my husband what will i talk to my husband the husband looks at her and he just says five words to her it's all right darling he just says it's all right i don't know how many of us as married couples have that kind of patience will have that kind of a heart at that point and in that tragic situation to bear that loss yet understand the situation and be forgiving we have a long way to go as a couple sandhya and i aim to be there in our ways in our challenges and that we will be there for each other i thank you reverend father richard for inviting us to this seminar on marriage and family and i hope sandhya and i have been able to add value to it yeah and thank you all brothers sisters for your patient listening thank you all thank you sir and ma'am for your words of experience and guidance they really touched our hearts